has omnipotent in the first line. Uh, it's kind of cool. That's a word that means all powerful. And I don't think you will find that in any modern like <laughs> praise song. <laughs> but, uh, it's, a, it's a great word. Our God is all, all powerful, uh, which is amazing. Well, today I'm starting um, my, what, what is my final series here at, at Las Palmas, uh, finishing the race. Uh, so kind of appropriate there when it came to my timeline of, of series I was doing this year. Uh, and on that note, I want to say my time here has been simply amazing. Um, this community is incredible and special, and all of you, getting to know all of you, has been just a, a, a joy. And so I really, as, as I preach this week, then I have three more after next week when Bo comes, um, I just want to encourage you to, to keep coming, to keep giving generously, and to invite your friends and neighbors. Um, this, this is the best place to be on a Sunday morning, uh, without a doubt. Uh, and you've got a community of people um, that could use what you have, uh, what, what, what you offer here. Um, so I just wanted to encourage you with that. This series was actually a suggestion by Rod Peak. So if Rod, if you're watching in Canada on YouTube, uh, I hope this series is what you wanted it to be. Uh, and so um, we're going to talk over the course of the weeks about how we, how, how we finish the race well. And, and when we think about things like last words, uh, final words are important. And so we're going to look at, we're going to base the series on 2 Timothy, which is Paul's last letter, not only to Timothy, but the last letter we have of, of his. So it, it, it works as kind of the last words, the last encouragement, the last things that he wants to say, uh, which which really we can learn lessons from. So as we're thinking about our own lives, how do we finish well? What are the things that Paul wants us to know that will help us do the same when, as, as he did? So I want to start this morning with a, with a little game, if that's okay, about last words, because last words are important. You know, they're kind of the <laughs> last thing people say. So I'm going to throw up a series of, of last words that people said, and if you know who said it, I just want you to shout it out, okay? No, don't raise your hand, just shout it out. You guys ready? Et tu brute. Caesar, right? Uh, Julius Caesar specifically, if you know the story, he was what God is doing in the world. And so there's a lot that we can learn in this, in this time because it's at the end of his life, it becomes something that's real. It becomes something intimate. And it becomes something that's encouraging to both Timothy and, and to all of us today. And so over the next three sermons, we're introducing it today, but in two weeks, I'm going to talk about the past and how do we let go of some things in the past. And we're looking at some of Paul's past. And, you know, it's kind of sketchy, but uh, we all have past, but our past can, can hurt us because maybe there are things that we need to let go of. Maybe there are things that are cause us guilt or shame or even bitterness that we need to... We need to figure out how to let go of in, in our own lives. And the week after that, I'm going to talk about the present and how we live now and how God wants us to focus on what we do in our mission and in the third week, the future. And how focusing on what God will do uh, can help us live life now the way he wants us to live. So that, again, at the end of all of our races that we're running, we can be like Paul and, and boldly say, I've, I've run that race. Um, I've, I've finished well. I've kept the faith. And I'm looking forward to something ahead, just like, just like Dorothy last week, right? So she, she ran the race, and, and she finished well. She finished well. So in this uh, intro to the, to the letter, uh, the question is, if you actually want to turn to 2 Timothy, if you have your Bibles with you, or turn on your Bibles if you have a phone or something like that, you can go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, this, this letter we, what we want to learn from Paul is as he starts this letter to Timothy, uh, what are his priorities? Like, what are the things he wants to address? That the, what are the most important things at this point of his life that he knows the end is coming quickly for him? What are the things he wants to address? What's his focus? And then from what he's addressing, what can we learn from that? How can we 
learn from Paul during that time of his life what we need to focus on in ours, in our own. So the first uh, bullet point in your, in your notes, if you can take notes today, is this. We want to find joy in what God is doing in others. The first key here, the first lesson that Paul is teaching us when it comes to his perspective on life, especially in this prison cell, especially at the, towards the end of his life, um, are we finding joy in what God's doing in other people? So here's, here's 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 5. Be you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. So what we, what we see here, again, at the very beginning of this letter as he's talking to Timothy, he's finding joy. He's finding joy in just thinking about Timothy, Timothy's faith, and what God is doing in, in, in Timothy's life. Remember, Paul's in a, in a prison cell. But he finds joy in thinking about others and what God's doing in other people's lives. And, and a lot of scholars think he was in this prison called the Mamertine prison um, that, that, again, would be just like a, a small, dark cell. Right? It's not like a, like a white-collar prison today. <laughs> and actually, before this, when, uh, uh, if you read the end of Acts, he was in a house arrest type situation and that would have been more comfortable but here um, his physical situation emotional situation all the things that you would be like this is not a good place for him to be his focus and where he's finding joy is in what god's doing in others especially in this case timothy and so what he's doing here is he's being encouraging to timothy and he's letting what God's doing in Timothy's life be encouraging to him in these moments of trial and difficulty in his own life. You see, there's commonality in the mission that we have as Christians. And so no matter where we are in life, it, no matter where we are, no matter our ages, no matter what's happening to us as individuals, there's commonality in our mission. We're part of one unified body of believers across the world. And so no matter what I'm personally going through, I can find joy that God's work is being done in the world and in through those, those around me. And what I should be looking for is the encouraging things God's doing in other people. How is God using other people? And how it, 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 are those things that I'm highlighting and talking about uh, and, and, and just celebrating. A lot of times we focus more on, on the negative than, than the positive. And what Paul's giving us here as an example is how do we, how do we encourage <laughs> So we weren't that close in terms of the family tree goes. Uh, so I thought, I need, let me reach out to him. It's a good opportunity to, to, to call him. And, and this conversation I had with him um, was, was unexpected. Uh, and it was very encouraging because David talked to me about his life. He talked to me about the relationship that he had with his father, which really wasn't much at all. He grew up actually uh, mostly living with his mom and, and not going to church. And then later in life, he joined the military and started dating a girl. Uh, and her, her and her family were strong believers. And her dad said, if you're going to date my daughter, you've got to go to church with us and, and read the Bible. Uh, and so they were kind of on again, off again for a while because he wasn't quite sure if, if it was worth the commitment of, of, of that stuff. But the, 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 the strength of the faith of, of the father was, was that strong. So he told me there was a day uh, as he's contemplating how much he likes this girl and, and what he wants to do, that he, he picks up a Bible that he had at his house, one of the only things his father had given him, uh, and starts reading. And in those moments, uh, he's convicted uh, and, and comes to Christ. 
and, and they eventually get married and um, go to church together and they want to have a family. But unfortunately, over time, they end up having several miscarriages, I think like seven, and, and a stillborn birth. So it's very discouraging. And one day they're at a, a revival. For those of you, you may not know what a revival is unless you like charismatic or assembly of God. But uh, if you're Baptist, you're like, what's a revival? Uh, it's, you know, you, you get a tent up and you get preachers that are excited and then you do lots of altar calls and you get spirit moving and you get people excited, right? So they're at a revival. Uh, and this guy comes to him uh, and prays for him and says, you're going to be a, a father and a pastor. Uh, and he said, nope and nope. <laughs> right? Those are, uh, the, he's like, I wish I could be a father. Uh, and like, pastoring was like not even on his radar. So when I talked to him, um, this is years ago that that happened. And his wife have, have two kids that are young teenagers. Uh, and he was just getting voted in to be the lead pastor of the church. It's stories like that, that that are good to share, that are good to talk about. To say, how's, how's God moving in, in the world and in people's lives and in your own lives? Hearing things like that is much more encouraging than, than uh, you know, finding faults or, or, or being too critical. We want to highlight what God is doing in the world and in and through ourselves and others and help people see that and encouraging them through that. So are, are we quick to encourage and are we looking for what God is doing? So in your bulletin, I want you to write this down. I want you to take a second. Just ask God for, for a name of a person that you can encourage today and just write their name down. Who can you call and just say, hey, I wanted to just call you and encourage you. Or you can go to their house here if it's somebody local, but somebody that you can reach out to and just say, I love you. I'm excited about what God's doing in your life right now. Then I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I thank God for you. I'll do it with Charles. I thank God for you. <laughs> we sit by ourselves in the, in the but. I thank God for you. How, how, how hard is that to say to somebody, but how often do we actually say it? I thank God that you're here. I'm glad you're here, right? What God's doing in your life is important, because again, with, for Paul, this idea of community, this idea of, of being part of the same mission, uh, he calls it koinonia a lot, and for Paul, it's this fellowship of believers that's so tightly joined together that, that we're sharing in each other's experiences. We're not doing this alone, but we're part of a larger body, a larger, a larger thing. And we got we to gotta really embrace that more sometimes in our lives. So Paul, as he's sitting in this prison cell, which, which, which any of us be the, being there would be like, this really sucks. For him, he can say, I'm finding a lot of joy thinking about you and your faith and what God's doing in your life, even in this situation, because God's still working. God's still working in the world, and we are all on the same mission here. Number two in your notes is we're to embrace our calling. You have to embrace your calling. What is it that you're called to do? And if you want to end the race well, and you want to say, like Paul said, I ran the race well, then, then live out your calling. You'll find the most joy in life will come when you're doing what God wants you to do. <laughs> when you align more with that, somehow that brings more peace, surprisingly. <laughs> and joy and comfort in, in your life, even if life itself is, is challenging. Aligning our lives and aligning what we do and, 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 and all that with what God wants for us brings rest and peace for us. So here's... The next section, this is verses 6 through 12. He says, For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, 
which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. I love this first phrase. He says, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God. Fan and to flame the gift of God. The, the, the Greek word there actually means to rekindle, to rekindle the gift of God that's in you. See, all of us have gifts. God's given you gifts to use, to, to use as a part of this common mission we're on, to use in your life to use in the church, to use all the time. And the, the more we can embrace and use the gifts that we have, again, the more we'll, we'll, we'll experience this joy in the community and, and see how God's using you and others in, in the world. But we've got we to use the gifts that we have. We've re we receive the Spirit, and the Spirit will lead us and guide us and, and help us use these gifts that we've been given. So the question is here, is what is your gift and how are you using it? And is it time to rekindle it? Because what Paul is telling Timothy here, and, and again, the, the, the power of this phrase and this word is this, all of us are given gifts, but is your gift being fl uh, flame? Is it flaming? Is it burning? Is it being used? Or is it like more of a pilot light right now? Because it's still there. But sometimes if we aren't using it, it can dwindle into just a little bit of, have you ever made a fire camping uh, and it, you get it going, but then eventually it goes out but, and, and you can see a little bit of ember in there still, right? It's not roaring, it's not going strong, but there's a little bit of fire left that can be a lot of us even here today. When, when we know we, we, are, we have gifts and we just haven't been using them. We haven't been experiencing what God can do in our lives and in the lives of others. We've just kind of let it dwindle. And what, what, what Paul's telling Timothy and, and, and telling us is you've got you to fan that into flames. And we've, we've all seen that, that little fire. We can get it going again with a little, bit of, a little bit of wind and a little bit of kindle. We can get it moving and we can get back up to roaring. You can take that little pilot light and make it, make it powerful. So the question for all of us is, what is, what is it in your life that, that you should be doing? What are the gifts that God has given you that you can be using here or at home or in the community or, or something? Because that's where you're going to see the work of God more. So in your bulletins, take a moment and write down what, what is your gift and what's something you could do to fan that flame. What's something you could do to fan that flame, that gift that you have, that God's given you? Just like Paul's encouraging Timothy here, fan it, rekindle it, get it moving and going. You want to be like Paul in, in a situation that he's in and be able to still say, man, look what God's doing in this world. Look how encouraging I am. And you got to be a part of what's happening. You can't just be you know, on the sideline. You've got to be participating in it. And so we've got we to rekindle that sometimes in our lives. And when we do, we'll see the excitement that's, that's happening all around us. And he, we can do this even in the situations that Paul's in. Like in his situation, he, he knew the dangers. He's under, probably under Nero at this moment. Uh, he knew the dangers of preaching. And so he finds himself in this cell. And, uh, and, and for him, he... He says, it's okay, because he, he calls it out here. He says, we, we, we've been giving not, not a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. 
and we share in the sufferings that, that are around us and the sufferings of, of Christ, and when we get to participate in it all, no matter what happens to us, we're sharing in the fellowship of the entire body, and we're growing more like Christ in the process. It's fascinating, because even in this situation that he's in, he's highlighting what God can do in the world. And I was talking to somebody just this week, and they're like, what's, the, like, what's something that somebody can focus on in life um, you know, if they want to grow and, and be, be a better Christian? Uh, and I said, you know what? We, we try to make things like that complicated. And then the day, it's, it's pretty simple. Like fundamentals are fundamentals because they work. <laughs> right? Have you ever heard that? Uh, and so I said, it's, it's just the fruit of the Spirit. It's just the fruit of the Spirit. And I'll, and I'll read these verses. He, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Right? There's no, like it, these are all things that we, we just learn to live with. And we, we live like in a matrix of those things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's also keep in step with the Spirit. So what's amazing about when he, when he talks about this is there's no, there's no secret here. The, the key to living life the way God wants you to live is just to ask yourself those questions. Am I, how's my love? How's my joy? How's my peace? Am I being kind? Am I being good? Am I being faithful, gentle, self-control? Right? Like, these aren't like magic concepts to find. <laughs> like, what does God want from me? Uh, they're right here. It's just we sometimes we don't want to necessarily challenge ourselves with those things. And so even, again, from prison, he can say, we have a spirit, not of fear, but a power of love, of self-control. And we can, he can embrace the, this, this fruit of the spirit idea because this fruit of the spirit idea, all these, all these characteristics here that we're supposed to emulate as Christians, it's not situational. It's not, oh, when you find yourself in a Roman prison, like, forget about all that. Like, you need to be miserable and like think about yourself more. No, like in prison, fruit of the spirit. Well, what about if I, you know, am having, I'm struggling in life and, and things are hard or somebody else hurt me? Fruit of the spirit, right? What if, uh, what if things are great and things are going well and like I tend to put God to the side? Fruit of the spirit, right? It's like this, these, these things aren't situational. They're how we should be living all the time. And again, if we connect the dots here and just try to be more in community and understand the commonality that we have and that what I do affects others, but we can experience life like Paul is telling Timothy to experience it as well. Because he's in prison. He's in prison. And we're supposed to emulate these things all the time. Not just in the good times, but, but all the time. And the third thing in your bulletins is this. Trust Jesus with the process and the outcome. Trust Jesus with the process and the outcome. Here's the last few verses here of the intro. This is 12 through 14. He says, But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. What's Paul saying here? That the, the work that's in us, Jesus started and he continues. Jesus Jesus does all the work. The Holy Spirit is in us. It's leading us. It's gui he's guiding us. Like God does the work in our lives. All we have to do is, is keep in step and follow. 
God's doing all the work. We just have to be willing to take the steps and follow. It's nothing more, Christianity and discipleship is nothing more just than your next step of obedience. What am I going to do next? Knowing that God's doing all the work in me, around me, in, in lives of other people. And am, I, am I looking for it? Am I encouraged by it? And can I just keep taking the next step of faith? He says this. This is a, a, a great charge that he gives Timothy. He says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. What's he saying? Be like me because I am like Christ. Be like me because I'm like Christ. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. These are other famous words of Paul. He says, be imitators of me. As I, am of, as I am of Christ. And this is the question for all of us. Just like Paul, can we say that same thing to, to others in our lives? Be like me because I'm like Christ. I'm doing the best. I'm taking the steps. I'm seeing what God's doing in the world. I'm a part of the community and the fellowship. I'm encouraged by others, and I'm giving encouragement and love. And my life is about what God is doing in the world, and, and I embrace the work of Christ in me. And, and because of that, I can say to you, be like me, because I'm like Christ. <clears throat> Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me and the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So what's the pattern that you're setting for others? It's the pattern you're setting for others to follow. It's never too late to think about that or to change a pattern. Uh, but the question is simply that. Because for Paul, at the end of his life, again, as he's in this prison, he can tell Timothy, follow the pattern I've set for you. Follow the pattern I've set for you. Because the pattern I've set is the pattern in Christ. And so can, can we do the same? If we want to end well and say the words that Paul is, is saying, I've, I've ran the race, I've kept the faith, what's the pattern you're setting for others to follow? These are, these are the keys as we begin this, this, this series of, of doing life well, of keeping the faith, being the people God wants us to be. And at the end of it all, as we, as we run our races, uh, we can say, like Paul says, I, I've ran well, I've finished the race. Paul wants Timothy to have a perspective about life. And although he had a past, Paul had a past. We'll talk about it next time. He, he did more than, like if, if anybody ever thinks, well, how can God use me? I've done some crazy things in life. <laughs> Paul's worse, <laughs> right? Paul's worse. And guess what? He wrote the majority of the New Testament. And now he's at his end of his life saying, the pattern I've set for you in my life you need to follow that, right? Not the old, not the old stuff, but the, the, the more recent stuff. He wasn't perfect, but he can say boldly that he ran the race and fought the fight. And as he's in prison and he writes and he begins this beautiful encouragement to Timothy, as, as final words, as a last letter of like, what do I want you to know before the end? We can, we can see just this encouragement and this joy that he has because of what God's doing in Timothy's life. And then for us, that becomes a pattern of what we need to see in our own lives and how we can take joy in those around us more and more. Perspective is everything. We need to find joy in what God's doing in others. We need to embrace our calling. And we need to trust Jesus as he's working in our lives. And then we just take the steps. We just take the steps. So if you want to run the race and finish well, this series will, will, help, will help you. It will help me. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the races that we have been given, this life that we have, the days you give us. But thank you most importantly for the gift of salvation that we have in Jesus, the Holy Spirit that we, we've received through, through that process of salvation and, and the ability now to, to be in community and to live life differently. 
So let's pray as we think about our own races, we can have the perspective that Paul has here, that we can take joy in, in what others are, 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 are experiencing and how you're working in their lives, and we can be that encouragement to others. We can, we can sh- sh- emulate what you want us to do, and we can just be beacons of light and love in this world. So I thank you for today and our time together in Jesus' name. Amen.